Salisbury Through the Ages, a children's peace pageant, July the 28th, 1919, presented by myself, Neil Lisi, in recognition of the centenary anniversary of Salisbury's largest ever parade and pageant. Telling the story of how one man, Mr. Frank Stevens, would, in a short space of time, bring together a city still in the throes of recovery from the war to end all wars, to produce pageantry upon an ambitious scale never before seen. Scholarly in its attention to detail, scrupulous in historic accuracy, and its completeness as a display of colour, pathos, humour and music, it would indeed be a spectacular entertainment. This painting, attributed to local artist C.E. Champion, shows Frank Stevens after he became director of Salisbury Museum in 1913. He appears to be shown seated in his study or office, holding a worked flint object, possibly a piercer, which would have been used to gouge holes in fabric. As well as being the director of Salisbury Museum, Frank Stevens was also author of one of the very first popular guides on the history of Stonehenge and its surrounding landscape. This presentation is based on the reports of a local newspaper, in this case the Salisbury and Winchester Journal and General Advertiser. 27th of February 1919, the announcement that started it all. When Mayor James Macklin asked the public for suggestions on how to celebrate the signing of peace and the provision of a permanent war memorial. March the 15th. 19 weeks to go. But none of those involved knew this at the time. From an initial report. A well-attended meeting of the citizens of Salisbury was held in the council chambers on Tuesday evening for the purpose of considering suggestions for the celebrating the signing of peace and for providing a permanent memorial to those who have been killed or who have served the war. The Mayor proposed that the celebration of peace should be marked by holding a united thanksgiving service and the next suggestion was that they should have a very elaborate children's pageant depicting the history of the city of which they were all proud. Mr Frank Stephen kindly promised to arrange the pageant. He then went on to describe some of the scenes that would be seen in his proposed pageant. From those faraway days when the mammoth used to go walk in Victoria Park. Succeeded by Roman soldiers, Old Sarah and Bishop Osmond, a Norman hunting party, Scenes of the foundation of the new city, the execution of Buckingham in the marketplace, Merry England rejoicing during the reign of Henry VIII, a May Day festival, and Queen Elizabeth entering Salisbury on her famous visit. The finale being emblematic, say, of the five rivers of Salisbury, or of Salisbury and her daughters, such as Salisbury, Rhodesia. He continued to say, the scheme was a pretty big one and would require a considerable amount of organisation. There would be work for everybody in it, but he thought there was no work that could not be overcome by careful election of several committees, each of which would carry out their allotted task. At the end of the meeting, it was agreed that Frank Stevens should arrange the children's pageant while the various suggestions for a memorial including a memorial obelisk, an extension of the Riverside Walk off Castle Street, a memorial hall and a public abattoir were to be referred to the committee for consideration before a subsequent meeting of the citizens. March 29th, 17 weeks to go. In the letters section of this issue, there appeared a letter from a John J. Hammond Long in detail, it was partly to suggest a new coat of heraldic arms which could be considered as a memorial to those who fought in the war. But also there was comment about Mayor Ivy's inclusion in the pageant. But the surprising ending shows to me an example of how, even at an early stage, 
the pageant had started to garner some controversy. If there is to be a pageant, there surely would be no need to have such an episode as the translation of St. Osman's bones from Old Sarum to the present cathedral. At best it is not a nice subject, and would be offensive to many. I am, sir, your obedient servant, John J. Hammond. April the 12th. Fifteen weeks to go. It was reported that a large audience assembled in the reading room of the Salisbury Public Library on Thursday evening when the first of a series of lectures arranged by the Library Committee was delivered by Mr Frank Stevens, the resident curator of the Salisbury South Wilts and Blackmore Museum. Introduced by Mr E. F. Pye Smith, Chairman of the Library Committee, Mr Stevens presented the lecture Salisbury Through the Ages in his inimitable manner, imparting much valuable and interesting information, tracing the history of Salisbury and surrounding lands from the Paleolithic to the Bronze Ages, from Roman to Medieval, very well received as proven by a hearty round of applause at its conclusion. Frank Stevens' inimitable manner would be something that would enthuse the children as they became more and more involved, enjoying their lessons, learning about Salisbury history, but also enthusing those volunteers who would become involved themselves. April 19th. Fourteen weeks to go. Here we see it reported that at the Council Chambers meeting on Monday evening it was provisionally decided that on the day officially appointed as the proclamation of peace a thanksgiving service should be held, a sports meeting should be arranged for the afternoon and that the day's proceedings should conclude with a bonfire. It was further decided that the children's pageant should be held on the following day or a later day. Also two memorial options were discussed a memorial hall and a riverside walk. It was decided that an appeal should be made for £25,000 to erect a suitable memorial hall. Mr Frank Stevens had given an outline of his, of his scheme for the children's pageant, but at the same time he wanted the committee to help him to carry matters through. He already had a nucleus of dress committee, a number of ladies having kindly offered to assist but he would require considerable cooperation in many ways from many people and would be glad to receive offers of help. Mind you, it was interesting to see that the ladies were the first to rally round with their help. He also presented a provisional programme promising a spectacle of rare interest. The basic premise being that all the Salisbury schools should be involved, each being given an episode or epoch dealing with the city's history. Upwards of 40 children would be dressed in costume, accompanied by fellow pupils in uniform. Costumes would be designed and patterns provided under the direction of the wardrobe committee to ensure a harmonious effect, something that was important to Mr Stevens, as he wanted each pageant to be of the same quality as the others. Now remember, this is still 14 weeks to go, and Frank Stevens is still asking for volunteers from the correspondence page. Sir, may I appeal through your columns for assistance of all kinds in the preliminaries of the children's pageant which is to form part of the city's peace rejoicing? At a time like this, a great difficulty exists in securing suitable material for the costumes, and I therefore venture to appeal to all Salisbury to assist in providing such material for the use of the dress committee. Gifts which will be especially welcome will be old fancy dress of any kind, and in any condition for remodelling, stockings any size and colour, odd ones not objected to, boys bowler hats, soft or velour felt hats, straw hats, any size, these need not be in good condition, old socks, casement cloth, old curtains, torn sheets, scraps of ribbon, etc. He also asked for volunteers. In the practical work, the following are amongst the many requirements of the pageant, so he said. Carpenter's work, painting, papier-mâché making, stenciling, 
Needlework, sewing on machine, knitting in coarse string, sewing on spangles, wire working, singing instructing, military drill, elocution, dancing, first aid, drivers, marshals, etc. Incredible that he had all this in mind and was going to try and achieve it without still knowing the date on which the pageant would actually be run. From a very early stage, Frank Stevens had already started planning the layouts for each epoch, and incredibly, they remained true to the ideas he first put on paper. From a simple drawing book as used by pupils in the schools that would be taking part, we can see those initial layouts for each historical pageant. No use of computers here, just straightforward pencil and paper. But already we can see there's going to be a large number of children taking part in each of the pageants. And for the moment, I'd just like you to keep in mind the four bearers that are shown in Cedric the Saxon's pageant. And here we see in epochs four to six, 30 children taking part in each. And as we can see, looking at the detail here, each of the children, the characters, would have a name. And as we look at this detail of the tailor's revel, we can see that Hobnob and the giant will be making a welcome appearance in the pageant. May the 3rd. 12 weeks to go and Frank Stevens was still asking for volunteers. Sir, may I ask you to invite the cooperation of ladies to assist in making dresses for the forthcoming pageant? Invitations have already been issued to many residents in Salisbury, and I ask for the kind indulgence of any lady who has not received an invitation for the occasion. All workers are more than welcome, and it is hoped that the weekly meeting will give me an opportunity of coming in touch with those ladies who are so kindly assisting us in our attempt to realise the life and time of Salisbury in past ages. A weekly meeting of workers will be held in the council chamber every Thursday from 2pm to 8pm in order that ladies may be able to come in at such hours as will suit their arrangements. Tea and stories of various epochs of the pageant will possibly add an interest to these gatherings. It may be interesting to add that it will be necessary to complete over 27 to 30 dresses weekly. I am, sir, yours truly, Frank Stevens, Master of the Pageant. I'm sure some of you are wondering by now, how come there is so much text in this presentation? To be honest, I did this on purpose, to try and give an idea of what it was like a hundred years ago, when the only information you could find about anything local, apart from gossip, would be through the newspapers. Without social media, for instance, such as Instagram and Facebook, people wouldn't be able to see just how the costumes were developing that had been talked about so much. So I hope to actually rectify this now. And so, what are those costumes created by many volunteers that came to attending the meetings held at the council chamber every Thursday with the Queen Mary's Needlework Guild there as a body, all under the guidance of the Mistress of the Wardrobe, Mrs. Jean Campbell Stevens and the Lady Mayoress Barbara Emily Macklin. As would be seen, no detail was missed in making the costumes as accurate as possible. And if you remember earlier, my asking you to remember the four bearers that you could see in the plan for the Cedric the Saxon pageant, here they are. And in my mind, this was probably the simplest to actually put together, Bishop Paul's procession by St. Martin's School, basically going and asking the choir boys if they could borrow cassocks. Interestingly, after the pageant itself was completed, proper studio-based photographs were also taken of some of the costumes and the people that wore them. These were actually then made available as postcards. And you can see here an example of how simple costumes would actually be made to measure 
all these girls wearing the same outfit, same design, but obviously of different sizes and different ages. In this particular photograph, I'd like to concentrate for a moment on the jester seated on the ground. From a postcard by B.S. Mullins & Co, we can see here Dorothy Verda Probin. Dorothy was the daughter of Alpha Probin, a greengrocer of Catherine Street, and she was also a pupil at Cambridge House School, Rolston Street. Now, while there are no colour photos or colour film of the day's events, we know that colour themes were an important part in creating a distinction between each epoch. As told by Frank Stevens, every dress and each accessory will be historically accurate, and the colouring of each episode has been carefully thought out on a definite colour scheme, in order that there should be no monotony and that each individual epoch should be distinct in every particular from the others such as those colours shown in the costume worn by Dorothy, which was recently on display in the Salisbury Museum. And here we see again the detail that went into each and every costume. And do you remember how one of the many requirements of the pageant was for people to knit in coarse string? And this is, I believe, what was knitted. Leggings for knights represented by the modern school boys, who were probably hoping they would never have to wear such things again, ever, in their lifetime. And I've got an itch, and I need to scratch it, and the photographer's taking a long time. Do you get my drift? And I always feel that the character on the right is grinning, simply because he's not having to wear those leggings. And here is a final selection of some of the costumes. And there is some historical wishful thinking in wondering if there is somewhere in an attic in Salisbury a costume boxed up that hasn't seen the light of day for a hundred years. Now, wouldn't that be a find? May 17th. Ten weeks to go. And in fact, the peace treaty that the pageant was going to actually celebrate still was yet to be signed. From a report in this edition. The Times understands that it has been decided, should the peace treaty have been duly signed, to hold the national peace celebrations on August 3rd, 4th and 5th. Sunday, August 3rd will be devoted to services of Thanksgiving. August 4th, the bank holiday is the fifth anniversary of the declaration of war by Great Britain against Germany. Another consideration has doubtless weighed the government in selecting dates mentioned is that they cover a period of generally devoted to holiday making and consequently there will be the minimum dislocation of public business. In other words, you can celebrate peace, but not if it's going to stop you working. May 31st. Eight weeks to go. In this edition, we find an interesting announcement amongst the council notes. The committee entrusted with the City War Memorial Scheme have, we think, come to the wise decision in determining not to proceed with the proposed Memorial Hall as representing the considered opinion of the inhabitants. For a good many weeks, it has been obvious that this form of memorial does not commend itself to the approval of a great body of the citizens, though it was decided upon at an open town meeting. We have previously pointed out that a memorial to be at all worthy of its object must command the approval of, at any rate, a majority of the inhabitants, and it would be unfortunate to the last degree to persist in a scheme which it is known has aroused strong opposition. Another scheme which it is believed will meet with more general approval is in the process of development. It is to be hoped the mistake of deciding too hastily will not be repeated and that there will be a scheme upon which everyone can concentrate and make it the success a war memorial ought to be. Now keep in mind that phrase, the mistake of deciding too hastily in mind as it comes into play again as the pageant date gets nearer. An important issue, as after a few weeks of quiet, the pageant featured in three articles. 
with just five weeks to go, you can feel in the council notes that there is tension in the air. Had the government statement published yesterday morning been known when the committee met on Thursday evening, it is probable that the amendment to fix a definitive date for the children's pageant would not have been pressed. The date of the national celebrations which are in contemplation in the event of the conclusion of the peace will be announced as soon as the peace treaty has been signed by the German representatives. In the meantime, the government hope that everyone will wait for these celebrations and will not upon the signature of the treaty indulge in any premature action which might be prejudiced to the collective entertainment and celebrations of peace by the entire country on the single date. Nationwide celebrations were therefore to be had all on the same day. And the notes continued. Under existing circumstances, to fix July the 28th or any other date for the Salisbury pageant would be a mistake. A hasty decision, there's that phrase again, would imperil the success of the undertaking. The amendment was whittled down to provisionally fixing the date for July 28th, which may mean anything or nothing. In the meantime, preparations for the pageant are going on. Citizens will learn with great satisfaction that there is no question of it being abandoned. In this particular edition, reading between the lines, it would appear that a lot of people were starting to think that the pageant wouldn't actually take place. In this second article, Frank Stevens was able to explain that there was in fact a great spectacle in prospect. Mr. Frank Stevens, master of the Salisbury pageant, asks us to contradict any rumours to the effect that the pageant will not take place. Mr. Stevens is working on the decision of the representative committee and he says, it is practically halfway through us for the preparations is concerned and there is a lot of work yet to be done and that can only be put through by a certain amount of concerted action. One of the chief things about it is people will say peace pageant and peace won't be signed. It is not necessarily a peace pageant but a victory pageant and I presume we have had victory already. At least they have been ringing bells for it. There is another thing that has been said a great deal. It has been said people's hearts and minds were too unsettled. People were too sad for anything of this sort. Well, my own impression is that the crowd of the Derby was a record one. Evidently, people were not too sad for that. In the second place, the last week saw two pageants, both of them successful, at Birmingham and Liverpool. Near a home at the little village of Eversley, they had three days pageant with 350 performers, assisted by men like Arthur Boucher and Gerald de Maurier. Canterbury has a pageant in hand. And coming to Salisbury, there were over 4,000 people at the park on Whit Monday. So it seems a little futile to talk about people not being in the mood for this class of thing. Even if they were so, it would be far better to abandon the athletic sports which are proposed to be held and everything except the memorial service. Let me tell you, there will be nearly 500 performers and 3,000 or more children on the ground. There will also be four-footed performers in the shape of ponies, goats, dogs, donkeys. There will be about 20 speaking parts, marching songs and dances to enliven the procession. And these, of course, will be repeated in the park. It will be an educational entertainment for all to enjoy. And the final article in this edition was from Mayor Mackling making an appeal for funds in connection with the Children's Day. A sum of £500 is required for carrying out the pageant which Mr Frank Stevens is organising and for providing children with tea and I earnestly hope that an early and generous response will be made. The appeal for funds for a permanent memorial have been deferred to a later date. June 28th, four weeks to go, and now important decisions were reached as a well-attended meeting of the Peace Celebration Committee held at the Council Chambers on Thursday. The Mayor explains that the appeal for subscription towards the proposed war memorial had not been made owing to the fact that peace had not been secured. 
He then went on to refer to the children's pageant, saying, Mr. Frank Stevens was proceeding with the work, hoping that he would obtain the support which was promised him. Unfortunately, he had not found that the support forthcoming to the extent he wanted. He had received a certain amount of support, and they were grateful to those who had supported him, but it was not quite sufficient, and in order that the pageant be carried out to a successful outcome, Mr. Stevens must have a little more support. Both Mr. and Mrs. Stevens were working hard to ensure the success of the pageant, and he hoped the citizens would give not only their moral support, but also their practical support. The General Secretary, Mr. F. G. Cole, read a letter addressed to the Mayor by Mr. Stevens, asking for the offer of a loan of ten well-behaved dogs, whippets for preference, for hunting parties, two reliable saddle donkeys for jesters, a white pony, other quiet ponies, good-tempered mongrel dogs, etc. Four weeks to go and there's still questions being asked about whether the pageant should go ahead. During a heated meeting, the question was raised as to whether the children's pageant was going to be held on July 28th or on one of the three days in August suggested for peace celebrations. The mayor said that the difficulty about holding the pageant on one of the suggested days in August was that the schools would be disbanded and a large number of children would be absent. Mr Pye Smith said people would be free on the August bank holiday and would want something like this pageant to witness and enjoy and he thought it would be unfortunate to hold it on another day even if a few children were away, surely the large majority would be available for the pageant. Mr. S. Williams pointed out that there were from 3,000 to 4,000 children involved and the movement and discipline of them was a great difficulty. Mr. Stevens imagined that so many children could only be moved about if they were under the teachers whom they were used to obeying and who were used to ordering. If they weren't available, the marshalling of the pageant would actually break down. Mayor Macklin said, The committee had to decide which date represented the least difficulties, and it was agreed it should be held on the 28th of July. Endeavour thoughtful of commerce, a Mr L. J. Sly suggested that the Mayor should ask tradesmen to close their businesses on that day instead of on Wednesday, the usual closing day. In response, a Major Forbes considered that they were very premature in fixing a date for holding the pageant in view of the fact that we had 600,000 men waiting to go into Germany at the end of this week and that we may be involved in a war again in a few days. I am in favour of postponement until it was known what was going to happen in regard to any resumption of hostilities or otherwise. To which that same Mr Sly retorted, If the war restarts, who will think of having a peace celebration? Even the clergy were keen to urge caution. As Archdeacon Carpenter said, I think it is extremely likely that the peace would not be finally settled in time to allow the pageant to be held on the date suggested. To which the mayor replied, We shall all understand that if we are in a state of war again, it will be observed to consider it at all. But eventually the committee fixed the Monday, July 28th, as the provisional date for the pageant. July the 5th. Three weeks to go and a meeting was held in the council chamber of the Salisbury Peace Celebration Committee when a preliminary programme was drawn up for the celebrations in the city on Salisbury the 19th of July, the official day set by the government as a general holiday. The mayor explained it was impossible for various reasons to hold the children's pageant on July the 19th, so they would accordingly take place on July the 28th as previously arranged. For July the 19th, the details for carrying out the following programme were referred to various subcommittees who were given power to act. These included the firing of anvils early in the morning at about 6.30, a mass meeting in the marketplace at 1pm when the proclamation of peace will be read, after which the band of the comrades of the Great War will lead a procession to the Victoria Park. Sports in the park during the afternoon with open air concerts concluding with dancing in the park an evening concert in the market house. However, it was decided not to arrange for a bonfire or fireworks display. And in this edition of the newspaper, we can see for the first time, the mayor acknowledging with many thanks, donations in connection with the children's pageant and tea, which were reported here. 
And we can see that those donations came from far and wide from all walks of life. From Mr Hugh Morrison, the MP at the time, donating £21 and Williams Best Malting Limited donating 10 guineas. To the ordinary man in the street, such as Mr T H Barrow, postmaster, donating 10 shillings and sixpence, while Mrs Jenkins of Two Castle Street donated 5 shillings. This was a good way of not only showing money being raised, but was giving impetus to others to join in for fear of being socially frowned upon for not making their own consideration and donation themselves. And now that a date had been firmly set for the pageant, so the selling of tickets and programmes could begin. For the first time, people were being presented, not only with details of the times and the route, but also the cost of admission to Victoria Park. And indeed, some of the stories behind each epoch pageant also, note some of the names advertised on the back of the programme. Look at the number of old businesses that until just a few years ago were still to be found in Salisbury, such as Magnet Stores, Wilkes, Son and Casey, Moore Brothers and James Macklin and Son. And here we can see the detail which went into describing the story behind each of the pageants. Remember, that Frank Stevens had wanted this not only to be a pageant of colour and excitement, but also of education. July the 19th, one week to go. And this was also the date of the National Day of Peace celebrations, when rain seriously interfered with things in Salisbury. While the streets presented a gala appearance, a heavy rain in the early hours of the morning was followed by a persistent dribble and occasional downpour. The rains hampered everything. And as reported in this edition, the firing of the anvils, the first item of the day's programme, was fixed for half past seven in the morning, and a few ardent spirits made their way to the marketplace to witness the ceremony, but the greater proportions of the citizens preferred to remain in bed and risk the threatened awakening. A hitch occurred in regard to the firing, however, with the result that although one loud report was secured, the remainder resembled the discharge of squibs. Now I'm sure there are some of you who are thinking, but what is actually meant by the term the firing of the anvils? Well, in fact, it was an alternative to cannon fire, in which two anvils, one placed upon the other, with gunpowder between, were used to create a loud report. In America, they still have firing of the anvil competitions to see who can actually get an anvil into the air high enough. However, I think on July the 19th, 1919, it was more to just make a loud noise, such as we can see here. Are you ready? <laughs> Despite the rain, many people still made their way to the marketplace for the one o'clock reading of the Proclamation of Peace. There, the Mayor and Corporation and others took up their positions on the steps fronting the entrance to the Council Chamber, and the Mayor then read the King's Peace Proclamation to the assembled crowd, who, at the conclusion, heartily joined in singing the national anthem and were led by the band and enthusiastically responded to the mayor's call for three cheers for the king. In the end, the continued downpours meant it was decided to postpone the sports during the afternoon and evening until the following Wednesday. In the evening, an excellent concert was given by the band of the 2nd Battalion, the King's Own Regiment. The first half of the programme was played in the banqueting room of the council chambers, which it was crowded with a large audience. Then about eight o'clock the weather showed some improvement and the remainder of the programme was played out of doors, to the great enjoyment of a large number of citizens, 
who thoroughly appreciated the series of items rendered by the band under the conductorship of Mr. A. T. Chandler. What I also admire in this edition is the acumen of C. Moody and Sons, as can be seen by their adverts. July 26. Just two days to go. And in the same edition, some businesses were making readers aware of their preparations for the children's pageant. The Masters Bakers Association has agreed not to deliver bread on that day, as they and many of their operatives will be engaged in voluntary help for the children's tea. We trust the public will assist them by taking sufficient bread on the previous Saturday. On the occasion of the children's pageant, Monday, July 28, 1919, Messrs. Style and Gerrish's business premises will remain closed all day. Also two days before the pageant, the infant children who couldn't take part were not left out. Reverend George Hugh Bourne, owner of Bourne Hill House, well known locally for his charitable nature, opened the garden on 26th of July 1919 for a peace tea held for the infant school children of Salisbury. In the final financial reckoning of the pageant, it was reported that the cost of teas for the infants and all 4,000 children involved in the pageants and parades actually came to the sum of £160. Aided and abetted, I'm sure, by being provided at cost and through the help of many, many volunteers. And as we near the date of the parade and pageant, here are a few extracts from the daily school diaries of Godolphin School. And in the entry for the 24th of July, we can see that with less than 48 hours to go, rehearsals were still ongoing for the peace pageant. And the entry for July the 28th reads, at one o'clock we assembled at school to be put into marching order by Miss Dewey. We marched to the Bishop's Gate in Exeter Street and from there to the recreation grounds. The leader, an emblematic figure representing the Tudor Rose. See Book of Words. The Book of Words was actually the pageant narrative, freely presented to each and every one of the performers, but also available to the public for the princely sum of one shilling. It is for me a great memento for anyone who actually took part in the parade to find themselves presented and named with a copy of the words. And to make it a bit more special, the copies presented to performers included additional pages showing a portrait of Mer James Macklin and also a foreword from Frank Stevens. Those sold to the public contained only the pageant narrative. And as you look at the words, it should be noted that they were all written by Frank Stevens himself. And so, just 19 weeks after the first mention of a children's pageant appeared in local newspapers, the parade was about to start. And now, from photos and postcards, we can follow the children's parade as it wound from Exeter Street through Blue Ball Row, Castle Street and Castle Road onwards to Victoria Park. From a report on the pageant, that appeared in the August 2nd edition of the local newspaper. For the brain that conceived it, the hands that fashioned it, for the performers who carried it to a conclusion. The Salisbury Children's Peace Pageant on Monday was a triumph. There is no room for a second opinion. Among the thousands of people who witnessed the city's first attempt at pageantry, upon an ambitious scale complete unanimity prevails. And what is an even more convincing evidence of the success of this most striking feature of Salisbury's celebration of peace is an appetite for more. Nothing upon this scale had ever been attempted within living memory and it took people by pleasant surprise. 
Regarded purely as a spectacular entertainment, the pageant was indeed pleasing. To minds that delved beneath the surface, it was more than pleasing for its educational influence, its scholarly attention to detail, and for its scrupulous accuracy and completeness defined. Almost perfect weather prevailed for the procession through the town. The streets presented a happy festive appearance. The processional route was gaily bedecked with flags and bunting. Soon after midday, crowds of people, not only citizens of Salisbury, but a large number from the surrounding district, began to take up positions along the route in order to obtain a good view of the procession and private houses along the streets were utilised and kindly consideration prompted the provision of favourable positions for which the older and less fortunate people of the city as well as convalescent patients from the hospitals could witness the historic spectacle. Large numbers of children from outlying schools were also accommodated along the side of the Blue Boar Row. The injunction to spectators not to crowd the streets in any part of the route was, generally speaking, loyally observed with the result that practically everybody was enabled to have an uninterrupted view of the procession which extended in length for about a mile. The following rare photos show three of the most important people behind the success of the pageant atop the crow's nest over the grandstand where Dr Franklin would conduct the choirs and musicians. And here we can see Mayor James Macklin, Mr Frank Stevens in the background, Dr Alcock, conductor, and, coming up the steps, Mrs Jean Campbell Stevens, mistress of the wardrobe. And here, from a newspaper photograph, we can see the crow's nest and grandstand together. And further from the newspaper report, Numbers, however, convey but a faint idea of the work of preparation superintended by Mr. Frank Stevens, master and author of the pageant, Mrs. Stevens, the mistress of the wardrobe, and carried through by masters and mistresses of the schools and other helpers, with the enthusiastic cooperation of the children. The debt owing to the master of the pageant is universally recognised and was perhaps best expressed in the little unrehearsed incident before the pictures in the park when, walking across the enclosure to his place on the stand, he and his wife were greeted with spontaneous burst of applause, a generous tribute to his labours. Every one of the dresses was made from designs taken by the master from authentic sources. Old illustrations, Wilton House pictures, tombs in the cathedral, or armour from the Tower of London. And so the pageant became educational in its details. Then again, endorsing the pageant was ordered according to a carefully thought out plan. The least artistic amongst the spectators must have noticed that here, no indiscriminate mixing of colours. Each epoch had its scheme, and as far as possible, the colouring of the period was according to that of old illustrations. All agreed, the general effect was beautiful, and none will easily forget the spectacle of the great crowd of children at the conclusion of the pageant, forming into a segment of the circle, advancing at a slow march, singing Land of Hope and Glory. In all respects, the pageant was prepared with care that endured its success. Only the weather was doubtful factor. But, although the sky was overcast during the performance in the park, no summer storm disturbed the stirring story the city has to tell. Dramatic but true, tragedy leavened by gleams of humour. It was, after all, nobly done. And now the film that would have been shown in local cinemas and theatres not long after the pageant, so that people could once again enjoy the spectacle.
and more memories of the pageant were available in the pageant souvenir. Printed shortly after the pageant took place, it told the story of each epoch, including a photo and a list of the performers' names and their roles, something to be remembered by. A grand souvenir, as well as an educational booklet on those key moments in Salisbury's history presented by the children of the city. And so now I'd like to give my thanks to Megan Beresford and the Salisbury Museum for giving me access to so many of the photos and items shown in this presentation. To Ruth Butler for use of photos that appeared in her talk, Salisbury, Peace and Aftermath. To British Pathé for making the film of the pageant available to the public. But most importantly, to two men without whom the festivities of July 28, 1919 may never have happened. James Macklin, Mayor, 1913 to 1919, and Mr. Frank Stevens, the pageant master.